this last talk is about secularism, and it's the good news. Secularism is coming to an end. Uh, we should be pleased about that. The, the reasons are very straightforward, uh, and the really good news is that it is liberals who are saying this, rather than people like me. Uh, I am certainly willing to pick the idea up. Those of you who got handouts, uh, I just tried number one on Wayne Detmer. He said, I don't understand that, so you better explain it. So let me read it. At the heart of today's debate about religion, multiculturalism, and secularism is an undiscussed fact. It is thought that unless some things are self evidently true, we can know nothing. And certainly, that is a requirement for post endarkment and indeed pre endarkment logical knowledge. But think about it for a moment. Can a Down syndrome child know God? Of course they can. It is not self-evident how that happens, because God does it. Uh, the, the, one of the things the liberals are, and the secularists have to learn, is a little humility. And the scientists, the same argument applies to scientism. And it's very simple to explain. I've mentioned it once in these four talks already, but it, uh, apparently it's okay to repeat things because people listen to the tape more than once anyway, so it might save them one hearing. Um, but your conversion is not a self-evident thing to anyone outside of yourself. It is not based on something antecedent to that, it's something that happens to you. This is important to start talking about. Because people would like to say that makes it irrational. But it isn't irrational at all. And that's easy to prove. And again, I think I've done this already once, and so those who've heard it can relax. But I love the situation where I get accused of being irrational because of my faith. Because then I'm home free. Under my breath I say, thank you, Lord, for delivering them into my hands. <laughs> uh, because what has happened is that they have misunderstood the world. And all I have to say to them is, what do you call someone who is truly irrational? And the answer, of course, is mad or crazy. What happens to their life? Well, it falls apart. They lose their spouse, they lose their job, they lose everything. Now, when somebody gets faith, gets converted, what happens to their life? Well, it, so to speak, falls together, doesn't it? It's not so dramatic. It's certainly in my case, you only have to ask my wife, uh, has to be striking, but it is real, and in her case too. We're both a bit more benign than we used to be. Uh, mellow, I was even described as by somebody who knew me as a student. Uh, that's what happens. So my faith is not irrational, it is supra-rational. You got the idea? That God's notions of knowledge are not less than ours, they're greater. And that's where we're headed. A form of knowledge that we do not yet really enter into. There are hints of it. I, I lo love is perhaps the wrong word. Perhaps one of the most challenging statements Jesus makes is, I do nothing except what the Father tells me to. And when Paul says, the life that I live is not mine but Christ living in me, what is he talking about? That didn't proceed by a logical argument from one thing to another. It's simply a statement of experience. So, the first thing that the secularists have to deal with is that there is a whole range of knowledge which their view of the world cannot handle. And they are in denial of reality if they pretend that it is otherwise. Uh, to, to get this argument down pat for your own use, uh, you read three authors in this order. You read Drusilla Scott, you read Leslie Newbegin, and then you read Michael Polanyi, uh, in that order. Uh, Drusilla Scott, because she's accessible and she writes beautifully, and she had dinner with Polanyi many times. Newbegin, because he's got a good mind and he thought it through and made a career out of translating it, and Polanyi because he's the original. And the fundamental idea at that point is that there is knowledge in this world which is real but not explicable by the liberal view of knowledge rationality. It's what I call tacit knowledge, using Polanyi's phrase. Conversion is the best example. 
If you want an example that you can go and read about and learn and then point other people to, Lewis's description of his conversion is a very good example. Lewis was a very smart man. Uh, he thought himself the smartest man in Oxford when he got his first degree. And he thought he was the best debater until he was beaten by Margaret Anscombe and he never debated again. Uh, he talked after that. Um, but he got his first degree and he was an atheist. And there wasn't a job. The only thing he was fit to be was a professor and there wasn't a job. Well, his father was wealthy enough, he paid for him to do a second degree. And he did his second degree in English. And he went to his first tutorial in Oxford and he'd been set up by God. Uh, you got half a dozen students in a tutorial group. How long does it take half a dozen smart students to work out who is the smartest student in the group? Uh, two minutes at the most. A couple of sentences and you know. Uh, a, couple, a few years ago we had a year in our medical school. With, within two hours of the start of the, the year, the competition was for third place. Uh, that happens every now and again. Well, two of the people in Lewis's tutorial group were going to have a major impact on Christianity in Britain over the next few years, apart from himself. So he was set up. And they, of course, were theists, and he was an atheist, and they persuaded him within a few weeks that you were a fool to be an atheist. So this step is purely rational in an enlightenment sense. Uh, the argument being that if there is no God and you believe there is one, you lose next to nothing, that's Pascal. Uh, on the other hand, if you believe there is no God and there is one, you go to hell, that's stupid. Uh, so in purely rational terms, it's not stupid to be a theist. In fact, it's the other way around. In biochemistry, I would do it with this sequence. I, I, I say to students, or used to say to students, what have we taught you in this medical school, in this science faculty actually, about the nature of the cosmos? And of course they're not expecting that in a biochemistry lecture. And so there's dead silence for a moment. And then I say, no, no, I'm serious. And I, the best I can hope for is a muffled big bang. And I say, well, no, no, I mean in more broadly philosophical terms than that. Would you be interested in some options? And they always say yes. They never say no to professors at that level. And I said, well, here are three. Let's go through them by means of questions. Uh, do any of you disbelieve the second law of thermodynamics? Now, there's nobody in an honours fourth year biochemistry class who disbelieves the second law of thermodynamics. And I said, the reason being, it's the law of entropy. Uh, and I say, that's interesting. Now, there are three possibilities, are there not? Let's see if you can think of any others. The cosmos could be created, it could be eternal, or it could create itself. Can you think of any other possibilities? They can't. There is one, I don't tell them about it till afterwards, and that is that it doesn't exist. You only think you are here. Uh, but, but they all believe the second law of thermodynamics is true. So I say, which of the models is therefore dead? And they work it out that for once Aristotle was wrong. If the second law of thermodynamics is true, it means the cosmos had a beginning and it will have an end. It's not infinite, it's not eternal, as Aristotle believed. So that's one down, two to go. Uh, how many of you believe you are created? Or the cosmos is created? Now, now it has wonderful geographical distribution in America, slightly more complex one in Canada. In America it's easy. 10, 20% at the most on the East Coast, 50% in the middle, and no known beliefs in the West. Uh, <laughs> In, in, in Canada, we have another time zone and a half to the east of you, uh, which has got lost in space, and they're well over 50% believe in God still. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go to Newfoundland, go. It's one of the most wonderful experiences in North America, and there are no five-star hotels. Uh, and it's not a nanny state. If you don't keep your eyes open, you walk 400 feet over the cliff into the sea. You know, uh, but marvelous place. And in the middle, it's 50% again as here. But before you get there, you go through Quebec, which is an essay in post-modernity, uh, <laughs> where people do not believe. Ontario is more like your East Coast, and our West Coast is lotus land like yours. <laughs> so in Ottawa, about 10% put up their hand like this, so that nobody else could see. Uh, and I say, yes, well, you're only Christians, you don't really count. And the class laughs, and then I upbraid them for their bias. If I'd said you're only Muslims, you would not have laughed. 
Uh, never let an opportunity like that pass. Uh, I said, well, now I know what you do believe, because there's only one left, and that is that the cosmos creates itself, which is what Bernard, Bertrand Russell and Fred Hoyle believed, but they did it for good reason. They wanted to get away from God. Uh, and when uh, the American astronomer, whose name escapes me at the moment, discovered the red shift, that was dead. Hubble, Hubble thank you. It had just vanished for the moment, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for shortening my Alzheimer delay. Um, so, anyway, if you believe that, think about it. In order to believe that you create yourself, you'd have to be here before you're here. That destroys logic. I need logic for this class. I suggest you leave. <laughs> and a proportion of them will. And that was wonderful because they were bad students anyway. Uh, but... That's Western rationality. And it's, it's, it's very useful, it's a powerful tool, but it's not sufficient. Now, Lewis was persuaded by rationality that it was smarter to be a theist than an atheist. And then being a rational man, he said, that means I'm a creature, I'd better pray. He hadn't done that since he was a child. And he says, I got down on my knees and I discovered that I was a zoo of ambition, a bedlam of hatred, a harem of lust. My name was Legion. He discovered sin, which is what you always do when you get on your knees, which is why we don't do it very often. Uh, that's what happened to Lewis. Later he described it as being picked up and carried, kicking and struggling into the kingdom. He didn't really know what was happening. Now, he spent a, little, a few weeks then trying to escape into a kind of uh, 18th century deism, but it didn't work. And then he describes his conversion, and he's honest, because it's not describable. He says he got on a bus at Magdalen College in Oxford to go the five-minute journey to Headington, and he knew he was being offered something. All he could say was that the choice was free. He couldn't describe what the offer was, but he did say yes. And he says it was an unpleasant experience, like taking off a suit of stiff clothing or armour, or being a snowman pushed out into the sun and beginning to melt. It was uncomfortable. Only in retrospect does he realise that he said yes to God. The next bit is even worse. He still doesn't know what to do with Jesus. And he says, he was thinking about this problem, and then he went with his brother on the motorcycle to Whipsnade Zoo, and they watched the wallabies jumping around in the bluebells for an hour or two, and when he got back, he did believe that Jesus was the Son of God. Now, he hadn't gone mad, but there's no rational process involved there. God was working on him. It's what Jesus says to Nicodemus, unless you're born of the Spirit, you cannot comprehend. Comprehension at that level is a gift of the Spirit. And that's what hopefully has happened to all of you. If not, I hope it will soon, even today. But far be it from me, I would never say to anyone, become a Christian now, because that's not my bailiwick. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. I would say, do you know that you ought to respond? If so, do so. And I will say to students, if you want to know whether it's true, do what Jesus says. Live as though it's true and see what happens. He warns you, you'll find out that it is. That's John 7:17. 7, that's a, an honest way to go about it. So that's tacit knowledge. And in this modern world, you are allowed to tell your own story. And they can't argue with that. Tell it. And point out that it's not irrational, because it didn't destroy you, it made you better, not worse, in all the areas that they actually care about. And after all, what do these men have in common? Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler, Newton, Boyle, Faraday, Clark Maxwell, all deeply committed believers. So it's not mind-numbing, quite the opposite. So that aspect of reality <coughs> has already totally penetrated quantum physics and cosmology, where I guess 90% of people believe in a god of some sort. If you want your children to preserve their faith in university, physics is the best place to go. I think it will be molecular biology next, uh, for much the same sort of reasons. You can always see the writing on the wall, it always appears first as a joke, at the expense of the people who are working there. Uh, and one of the molecular biology jokes going around at the moment is about the molecular biologists becoming too arrogant and saying to God, given all your resources, you really screwed up. 
we can make better cells than you can. And God says, oh, really? That's an interesting concept. Why don't we have a cell-making competition next week? And they've dug the hole and fallen into it. There's no way out. So come next Thursday, they go to the laboratory to have a cell-making competition with God. But God got there first, of course. And when they come through the door, he looks at them and he waves his finger and says, no, 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 bring your own dirt. <laughs> and if only I could get American creationists to realize that the first and only really important question is, in the beginning, what? And don't teach your children to go anywhere else in that debate with anyone who won't deal with that question. They believe in creation ex nihilo, it appears. So do we, but not quite the same one. Uh, how God did it? Well, you have to be a very naive reader to think that he, did, he told us exactly how he did it. But that's another issue. Uh, so, the secularists are beginning to engage this. They're beginning to realize that their world is not as secure as it used to be. Now, there's no question, and we should never back down on this one, liberal democracy, as I put down as number two, has been economically the most successful form of government the world has ever seen. But it has been built on an unacknowledged Judeo-Christian set of ideas, premises now denied, which are actually the foundation of liberal democracy. As I said earlier this morning, uh, Smith's economics are only Adam Smith's economics, only work for people who share Adam Smith's beliefs in the long run. Uh, and those are not recognized yet, but it's the secularists who are beginning to realize it. Now, the person who brought this to my attention is a man called Michael Novak, who's an American professor of business in New York. And last year in June, July, in the June, July issue of First Things, there's a, a paper it's worth you getting by uh, visiting the website, firstthings.com. And just look for Michael uh, Novak. I think the paper, if I remember rightly, is called The End of Secularism. Um, and it's a very interesting paper. In it, he points out that some very striking um, modern... Western intellectuals are making some very interesting comments. The first one is a man called Jürgen Habermas, who's a hard-nosed rationalist who was a Marxist from Germany. And he has been saying now, since before September the 9-11 uh, the episode, uh, he's been saying that maybe we secularists need to realize that we are only a minority. And we should realize that what we thought was going to be a regression of religion is not true. Religion is flourishing everywhere in the world except Western Europe. We are a minority. And Jürgen Habermas goes on to speculate that he's not sure that the liberal elite can show the tolerance that they say is so important. <laughs> and the tolerance they need to show is to Christians. He says, why is it only Christians who are expected to leave their own vocabulary at home when they enter the public square? After all, this is a democracy. Don't leave your, your vocabulary at home. Use it. But use it in as clever a fashion as possible. The best way, of course, as I pointed out earlier, is to learn to paraphrase the Bible. Because they're so biblically literate, they won't know that you're using the scripture. <laughs> and because you've paraphrased, they can't Google it. And so they have to think about it. And that's what you need them to do. Its wisdom is powerful. Uh, that's what's at issue here. Now, Habermas uh, actually was a good friend of a man called Ratzinger, whom you may recognize as the, the cardinal who preceded, so to speak, the present pope. He's now Benedict. And they had a conversation which was written down a few years ago. And this year, uh, Ignatius Press has published it. So there is a dialogue between Benedict and, and Habermas on this issue of how we speak to one another in the current state of the world. Very interesting. 
well worth reading. Uh, very short book, but worth having on your shelf. And of course, this is, this is Benedict's objective. I was very amused when the New York Times, of course, along with sundry other liberal newspapers, thought that uh, Benedict had made a huge mistake in his Regenberg's address about, uh, uh, about tolerance and the Muslims and their intolerance. And of course, he hadn't made any mistake at all. He knew exactly what he was doing and he knew what was going to happen because he says his prayers. Uh, and, of course, it did happen. You know, there were no burnings of embassies or riots around the world because of that address. Instead, you had Muslim intellectuals from all over the world scurrying to Rome to say to Benedict, yes, you're right, we do need to talk about this. And this year, this summer, they've had a conference. I haven't heard how it went. Uh, but he points out, that, uh, Benedict has pointed out, that we Christians need secularists to keep us from any sort of overreaction in the sense of becoming uh, too certain that we've got everything right. And they need us because of other things that we'll, we'll come to next. But they are better dealt with by another secularist who I had the great pleasure of meeting a couple of weeks ago. Uh, is John Yoon here? No, no, he's probably not. He has to go and look after children or do residency. But I had the great pleasure uh, two or three weeks back uh, of doing grand rounds at University of Chicago. They haven't had anyone like me do rounds, certainly not on what Hippocrates knew and we've forgotten for quite a long while. Uh, but it was a God thing. John Yoon, who made it happen, or at least it happened because of his prayers, uh, is a Korean-American who uh, told me when I got there that he had heard me speak when he was a medical student at Southwestern in his second year. You probably remember him. <laughs> Have you seen him at this conference? Yeah. Uh, and he was losing his way at that point, and that afternoon in Southwestern was a turning point for him, and his faith has flourished. But he says in residency in Chicago, he's felt that he hasn't done much for his, residency, his, res his fellow residents in terms of witness and evangelism, and it was a feature of his prayers, both repentance and... He said, God, I would like John Patrick to come and do rounds in the University of Chicago. Now, that's a ridiculous request. Uh, because Grand Rounds nowadays in mainline universities are all about gene speak, and I haven't done any of that stuff for five or six years, so I'm not going to get asked. Uh, people go and write up their most recent bit of DNA and send everybody else to sleep, you know. It, it, it's pretty boring at the moment. That's not to say it isn't important, it is, but they've got to find better ways to do it than gene speak. But once a year, the residents in Chicago are allowed to choose their own speaker. And so they, each year they elect a president uh, or a chairman of the group that's going to choose the speaker, and they elected John. Uh, he then, of course, had to go around the class and ask them for their recommendations, and he put my name on the list. Well, all the others were currently famous academics, and I was utterly unknown, of course. Uh, but God was going to answer John Yoon's prayer, because one by one, all the others said, sorry, but it's inappropriate timing, or I can't come, or I married a wife, or whatever, you know. Uh, um, and so I end up doing it. And it was a wonderful experience. It worked very well. Uh, and he was blessed in the process. There's, there's an openness. And one of the things I said to him, he said, is there anything I can do for you while I'm in Chicago, and I said, well, I have an outlandish request. I would like to meet Robert Fogel. Now, Robert Fogel is the first econometrist in America to win a Nobel Prize for economics, some years ago now. A Jewish, uh, unbelieving man who married a black Episcopalian lady who he told me two or three weeks later actually raised their children. He didn't. She died about 18 months ago. You should start praying for Robert Fogel. He's actually, he doesn't know how ripe a fruit he is. Uh, he's ready. He just needs the appropriate stimulus, the work of the Holy Spirit. But he wrote a book uh, a little while back now, two or three years, that Michael Novak drew my attention to called The Fourth Great Awakening. I never thought I would read a book by an atheistic Jew which dealt very sensitively and with approbation with uh, 
Whit uh, Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards and even Finney. He says America's success as a nation economically has had a lot to do with the revivals that have occurred. And he thinks a fourth one is underway. I think he's right. Uh, this one is a very quiet one and it's happening amongst the young who are recognizing that their 60s parents got it all wrong, they are totally opposed to divorce, they're moving away from, divorce, uh, from abortion, and they will listen to people like me for a long while. There's some, I don't know what it is, but something quite interesting. Somebody else said the same thing this morning, but uh, God is at work in some way. And Fogel's point is, that the future success and continuing prosperity of America and of the whole of the Western world does not depend upon economics nor upon skill. It depends upon virtue. And here's his list of virtues. Not exactly ours. He gives 15. And they're in order of importance. Note that number 15 is self-esteem. You need... <laughs> A little, but not much. Books on self-esteem should be removed from the church library. I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells how much self-esteem? Uh, nothing. Our esteem comes from the fact that Christ lives in us. Not anything to do with us. But Fogel's list is this one. Uh, since it's 15, I have to read it and you have to go and think about it. Number one that I began earlier in these talks with is that teleology again, that sense of purpose. It's popping up all over the place. It was thrown out with the endarkenment and the biologists of all people are trying to say no teleology here. In fact I had a medical student, a note from a medical student uh, in Oxford who wrote how wonder wonderfully the heart was constructed and her tutor said, if you ever use a phrase like that in my class again, you will fail. But, of course, in biochemistry, it's hilarious. Because now we have the human genome, the next step, of course, is to express it. Which means to take the DNA, stick it in the appropriate mixture, and get it to make the protein the gene is supposed to make. Now, when you've got the protein, it's an ugly looking little beast, really, to us. Uh, if you look at it, it looks a bit like a cat's cradle. It takes quite sophisticated eyes to see its considerable beauty. But when you've got the protein, what's the next question you have to ask? What's it for? What's it for? You can't avoid it. What does it do? What's it for? That's teleology. It went out the front door and it's come in the back door. And you can't get away from it. And deep down, that's going to work its way through the molecular bio biological world. That's why they hate things like the Unlocking the Secrets of Life video. Isn't it? it I mean, it's, it speaks volumes that the one bit of molecular biology that won't be talked about in high school, or the bits that won't be talked about, are things like uh, the motor that drives flagellum in bacteria, or the, uh, uh, the ATP pump, or whatever. These things that can only be thought of as machines. And the only way you can deal, deal with a machine is asking what it's for. And if you've never seen that video, you should get it. It's, it's a beautiful little video uh, that, that Philip Johnson made. And I've forgotten the name of the guy who did the work. I mean, it's been around for 20 years. But here you have a little motor that does a... Oh, sorry? Jay Richards. Jay Richards, is it? Thank you. Uh, it's a little motor that goes at 100,000 RPM. It can stop in a quarter turn. It's so small you can't see it except in vague outline with an electron microscope. Uh, it has no temperature gradient. It can rebuild itself en route, so to speak. It has about 20 unique genes. And basically it's an outboard motor. Absolutely stunning piece of engineering. Nanometers across. Nanomachines are fascinating. This stuff, they can't go on looking at it and not ultimately have the wow mechanisms activated. It's not there yet. I, I, I remember when a, a colleague of mine who'd been working on the double reading frame in, in DNA, uh, the solution came up. He didn't get it. Uh, 
uh, Michael introduced me to somebody who knew the guy who did get it. Uh, and I'll tell you that story in a moment. But uh, I said to him, isn't that amazing? And he said, well, it's just there. He was so obsessed with the, the nitty-gritty of expressing his genes and measuring what had come out, he couldn't see the, the wonder of having two sequences of genes out by one base. We can't even model this on a computer. They both read sense. Now, the guy who cracked it was actually a Christian. Uh, and I was told that he was sitting in his laboratory sometime after midnight looking at his data because he got more protein out of the strip of DNA than he could account for. And as he looked at it, he said, oh my goodness, I've got two genes in the same sequence. Isn't that amazing? And he said, he sat there for the next two hours enjoying the fact that only he and God knew this. <laughs> <laughs> this world is creeping in on the secular elite. The political end don't have a clue what's coming to hit them. But some of the academics do. Robert Fogel is one of them. Hence he puts teleology at the top of his list. You cannot live without the idea and you cannot live as a person without purpose. The next thing he puts on the list is a vision of opportunity, a sense of what we could do, which of course Christianity has a lot to do. You see, with our linear history, not circular time, but linear time, a, huge differently, a hugely different world. The third one he puts on the list, a sense of what comes next. Christians are very bad at this. Uh, when you're doing science, the number of questions you could answer is innumerable. Success in science is much more to do with intuition than it is to do with technical skill. It's what you decide to do. Which bit of data do you take to be the important bit? You get it right and you have a marvellous result. You get it wrong, you spend years chasing an artefact. Uh, famously, Einstein felt his equations and then had a great deal of work to do to see whether his feelings were correct. PhD science is boring, uh, you do it for someone else. But the next step, when something happens, that's exciting. Uh, and that's one of the most wonderful things that can happen to anyone. Uh, and that's something you can pray about. Uh, rightly so, it's God's world you're exploring. Science should be practiced in a tacitly atheistic view, a tacitly, tacitly atheistic way. When I did science full time, I wanted to know how much of the world I could explain without reference to God. That's what science does. And that's appropriate because it's under God. Uh, I didn't want to prove that God did not exist because I knew he did. That wasn't the point. But I was wanting to understand, as Einstein put it, I want to think God's thoughts after him. Uh, and that happens every now and again. And when it does, it, it's the sort of thing that sends tingles up your spine. One of the, the pleasures, joys of my life was to be allowed to discover the solution to the problem of refeeding deaths in malnourished children. It was the last 5% of mortality. Every now and again, when you start to refeed somebody who's been malnourished, they just drop dead. And I eventually wrote a paper that, that was the solution to that problem. It ought to have had my mother's name on it. Because the only reason it happened was that a long while ago, imprinted on my backside was the idea that teaching, speaking truth was very, very important in our family. And I could have neglected the data that led to the solution on the five standard deviation rule. But I've been brought up to first make sure it wasn't right. And to cut a long story short, that, re that led to that solution of that problem. Uh, that wasn't science, that was science plus, if you like. Uh, and that's the real world. Uh, there are so many examples, and you need to learn them, teach them to your children. One of the ways I do it now is the following one. Uh, you can imagine this in your high school. I'm going to tell you in the next 20 seconds or so, the biography of a man whose name you should all know. Some of you heard me do this, you can have a 20 second break. Um, but it works. He was born in London to a very poor family. His father was a blacksmith. He had no formal education to speak of. He learned to read and write in the church where he would go two, three, four times a week. By the time he was 11 or so, he was an apprentice 
uh, to a bookbinder in London, learning to bind, amongst other books, Encyclopedia Britannica, which he read, large chunks of, became fascinated by the science, and very shortly started to go to the free public lectures on recent developments in science at the Royal Society. He took very good notes. By the time he was about 15, he knew he didn't want to be a bookbinder. What he wanted to be, in our terms, was the lab tech at the Royal Society who set up the experiments for public demonstrations. And so he bound his notes very nicely, which he could, and sent them to the president, who amazingly read them and was impressed at their quality, even more impressed by the amazing suggestions about what could be done next. He got the job. Very shortly, the president wouldn't travel without him. So whenever he went round Europe, he took this young man with no formal education with him. And he met all the famous scientists alive at that time. Eventually, he himself became president of the Royal Society, although he had never had a day of formal education in university. He was known to stop the meetings of the Royal Society so that he could get to his prayer meeting. Raise your hand if you know who he was. Yes? Michael Faraday. Michael Faraday, yeah. Would that make a difference to your high school physics program if the unit on electricity began with that story? Would it be pedagogically defensible? Entirely, because it could capture the excitement, the enthusiasm of many 14-year-olds. You mean, he did that with no education at all? Then I can do something, too. Uh, uh, you know, it's an amazing story. I could keep you with those stories for hours, but that's not the point. Here's a young man who God was at work on, and what an amazing contribution he made. Uh, Mr. Faraday's Fields. And of course, the next person in line is another great Christian in the electricity story, Clark Maxwell. Uh, we don't know our own history. Biography in particular, which I grew up on, is not read as much as it should be. There are a few good books on these things now. I, um, make sure your kids know about them. So, that's what Fogel re understands. Families that, that can generate this kind of passion for learning joy in the world around us. The world should not be boring. Uh, quite the opposite, it's God's world. And We used to give our children mental health days from school when they were boring our kids. I actually write and say, Jonathan needs a break from this boring school. And they would never take me on, you know. Uh, that's the way it goes. We need, do that. Uh, you pay your taxes, you can complain about what they're producing. Uh, we need to. The next thing on his list is a strong family ethic. He's Jewish after all. He knows that his love of learning came out of a family environment. You ask any teacher, which kids are going to give you the most trouble next year? Single parent families and families going through divorce. They all say that. They know it. Very politically incorrect, absolutely true. The next one, a sense of community. The, within a real church where a real love of learning is flourishing, children are going to have modelled for them what is necessary. They're not going to get that from television. They're not going to get it from their peer group activities. My wife has for years been saying, we are so stupid the way we're having all these age delineated activities in church. We need far more cross-generational activities. The worst example, of course, is we're warehousing old people to die because they have no meaning, or we have single parents who need grandparents. It doesn't take a genius to see what the solution to that problem is. Uh, we need to do that within the context of the church. Uh, the next one he puts down is a capacity to engage with diverse groups. We've got to learn to deal with different groups because that's our world now, whether we like it or not. We better learn what the questions are, how to discuss them with civility. Next he puts, as a Jew would, an ethic of benevolence. I mean, Judaism was the only religion in the world in which the measure of the effectiveness of their obedience to God was their treatment of the poor and the dispossessed and the foreigner. We're losing that now, aren't we? Uh, we've got to be careful in this world, but it's still there. Uh, the next one is a work ethic, uh, a real work ethic. Uh, 
we don't have it in the way we used to. And some of it's good. I mean, I worked 100 hours a week you know, when I was a, began my professional training. That's uncivilized and it's dangerous for patients. Uh, but nevertheless, if you don't put in the hours, you don't see the patients, do you? There's no substitute for experience. Christians can make it up by going to work in the developing world, where in three weeks you'll see three years' worth of pathology. Uh, that's one of the good reasons for going. Uh, next, a sense of discipline. This is a huge problem nowadays. Huge problem. Self-discipline, in particular, is absent in many of our kids. Christian kids included. Uh, how do we train that? Well, I think one of the things to start with is, I look back now and I was blessed that I went to a church that made, made no provision for children on Sunday morning. But the service was serious. And children have a very high sense of whether their parents are seriously engaged in what's going on. And they will respect it. So I learned to sit and I listened. And children do listen. When I started teaching students, that when they started their families, they should teach the stories of the, the Bible to their children from the King James Version, not because of its translation, but because of its role in literature. Uh, a year or two later, about four years later, a couple who met in my Bible study group and got married, uh, whose wedding I was the preacher, uh, turned up at a conference. And their five-year-old sat in the front row and listened to me for an hour or more. <coughs> And I said to his father, Bob, Josh is an amazing little guy. He said, well, we did what you said. He now joins in conversations at home with stories from the Bible that were read to him in the first two years of his life. After all, you learn a language without any formal training in two years, but there has to be some grist for that mill. Why don't we make it the Bible instead of some of the stupid material we do use? Uh, you have the problem, don't worry about it, that kids who have the Bible read to them early might read a little late because they get frustrated with wanting to read things with real content and going through the work of, you know, the cat sat on the mat is boring but you've got to do it in order to learn to read. They do do it eventually when they want to do it desperately enough. Uh, the boys are the worst, the girls as usual are better at being uh, subordinate to the rules around them. But this sense of discipline is important, learning those things. And I, I'm told, I don't remember it of course, that the first thing I did was I wrote out the whole of the Psalms before I went to school on Sunday mornings. Not a bad thing to do. Uh, it, it, it must impress somewhere in your mind even if you don't know about it. The next one is the capacity to focus and concentrate one's efforts. Uh, Newton, for instance, when working on gravity or Handel writing the Messiah in, I think it was eight days, with hardly a break. That's concentration. Uh, most kids have a concentration span now about 20 minutes uh, to begin with. You can take it a lot further. It's not true that people can't concentrate for longer than that. They can. All you need is a little ironic humour to give them a break. Jokes are not a good idea because they take them off track and they take 20 minutes to come back. But if you can just get a little wisp of a smile, that sort of resets the clock. You can easily uh, do an hour's lecture if there's the odd smile in the process. Uh, you can lose them in ten minutes if you're utterly boring, you know, or less. You know, a couple of famous academics I would uh, employ as soporifics, they can send me to sleep in less than two minutes. Like the, the Journal of Clinical Investigation, you know, if you want to go to sleep, what better journal is there, you know? It's <laughs> gone, you know. Uh, the next one on the list is a capacity to resist the lure of pleasure. That's important. These are virtues, aren't they? And the, the twelfth is a capacity for self-education. The thirteenth, a thirst for knowledge. The fourteenth, an appreciation for quality. That's an important one. Because instead of realizing how difficult that is, we run courses called critical appraisal courses, or uh, various courses with criticism in the uh, title line, as though you can teach people to critique. And of course you can't. It's a rip-off course. You can show people what quality is as judged by you. Whether they can do it or not is not something you can promise that they will do. You can take the horse to water. You cannot make it drink. Uh, the good students get it, the other ones don't. 
Uh, once I realized what the problem was some 20 years ago, I stopped using the examination hall and didn't use it. Uh, I had totally open book exams that lasted about eight hours. Um, the students would come to my office at 8.30 in the morning to get the question, and the answer had to be in by 5.30 typed. And they may talk to anyone, they may use the internet, go to the library. There was no normal access, including their fellow students, that wasn't available to them. If they used their fellow students, they should tell me, and there was a 5% penalty. If they didn't tell me, I would find out, and there'd be a 10 or 20% penalty. I only ever had two girls who took the 5%. They said, we always do everything together anyway. We couldn't conceive of doing anything else. And in fact, if you, got, if you ever employed one, you'd get both, because they discussed everything all the while. Uh, but it worked. I picked up bright students who'd been losing out to that point because of boredom. Uh, and I still meet students today who remember those courses because I taught them by... I realized I didn't have to use the most recent bit of science, although I often did, but what I wanted them to do was to know how to read the literature. What we do as professors is teach students to read. I'm serious. That's what we're doing. And so I would take a scientific paper and go through it quickly with them, explaining what the issues were, and then I would say, write a precy. And uh, they were too proud to tell me they didn't know what a precy was, so they wrote a summary. Now, these were honest students who were used to getting 80 90%, and none of them got over 50. You can imagine the response that the first uh, handing back of their efforts. But I'd done, they'd taken hours to do it, and I'd taken 40 minutes to do mine, and we compared the two, and they began to learn. Very shortly, they got the habit. And if you don't believe this works, try it for yourself. I guarantee that a good number of you could not, for instance, give me a thumbnail sketch of the epistles. Take a short one like, oh, Philippians, not too long. Could you tell me how it's structured, how Paul said about it, where the argument goes? The answer is, in most cases, no. If you want to do that, write a précis. It's the French word for precise. All you have to do is remove all adjectives and adverbs, make all complex sentences simple, and remove all illustrations. Just put them in square brackets, if there are any, and metaphors too. You write something ugly, but it has got the essence of the argument down, and you will know what it's about. You will have a structure for the rest of time. I could do that for you now, say, in the Sermon on the Mount, I could give you the structure in the next three minutes quite easily, through having done that process. That's the way it works. It's a classic method of teaching, and of course, from my point of view, it made life a lot easier, except the examination took a... Marking papers took a lot longer, but preparation for lectures took about 30 seconds, which was great. It meant I could do lots of other things. And students still come to me uh, 20 years later and say thank you. So that's how you teach quality. If you have a hobby, you can recognize quality in your field very easily. And then you rationalize how you made that decision, because in most cases, you don't know. It's the same with when you see a surgeon who's very good. You know he's very good first, and you rationalize how you came to the decision afterwards, but that wasn't the way you actually did it. You don't know how you did it. None of us do. A really good violinist like Pinker Zuckerman can even tell you who's playing sometimes, or what instrument he's playing. He doesn't know how he does that, but he can hear it. That's real learning. That's how we know God, isn't it? We don't know him in the sense of the reductionistic world, which is, which is being forced on us. But in a world that is much more intuitive and experiential, but not irrational, super rational. So that's the world we're in. And Fogel and Habermas are saying, this is what we've got to deal with. This is the limiting factor in the world. A few years ago at Augustine College, we had... A couple of Chinese, or three Chinese gentlemen, headhunters. And they were from the Beijing government. And they wanted us to go and teach in China. This was eight years ago, at least. Uh, and we said, that's crazy, we're all Christians, and you're Marxists. They said, that's why we want you. And we said, explain. And they said, well, when we lowered the, the bamboo curtain and let the leading edge scientists from the Western world into China, we rapidly divided them into two groups. There's one group who came, gave their lecture without any attempt to 
adapt the lecture to the level of the audience, and then became tourists. They're no use to us. Another group came, first found out the level of the audience, adapted their lecture, then found out about the brightest student and found graduate positions for them. Those are the people we want. Most of those were Christian. We also realized that you in the West, they got to the Fogel point before Fogel. You in the West think the Chinese problem is technical and economic. It's not. It's ethical. Chinese planes crash more often than Western ones. Chinese buildings fall down more often than Western ones. It's not because they can't, but because they don't. They substitute second-class materials because that's the ethic of their system, and the Chinese know that. Corruption, they said, is going to destroy us. You can see that. Every time there's a disaster, it's worse than it should be because all sorts of shortcuts were taken in various ways so somebody could make a quick profit. And they know that's the problem. What came next was stunning. They had done an analysis that no Western government would do. They said, we have looked at the ethical systems of the world and the only one that will support science is Christianity. So we want someone to come and teach Christian ethics without transcendence. <laughs> <laughs> Utterly impossible, we said. But they went further. They said, we realize that teaching ethics to 23-year-olds is a waste of time, which it is. That these things are put in, as Sogol says, before you get to kindergarten, almost. Certainly in the very early years. So what we need, the first course they wanted was the Bible in English literature. Because they understood that you cannot understand the stories at the heart of Western culture if you don't know the Bible. The Bible is the key. How many of you got Eilis in Gaza when I used it as an example this morning? One again, two or three. Yeah, it should have been all of you. You all actually know. Who is it? Samson, that's right. So when Keats wrote that poem, Three words introduced into that poem a whole story of all that was given to Samson, how he screwed up, and the end when he destroyed the Philistines blind in Gaza. All in three words. That's a rich culture. Now when I talk to students, they understand every word in the sentence and miss the meaning. Especially students from other cultures. They don't understand why they're missing things, but it's not their first language and they're, they're not deeply biblically literate in English, which is what you need to be able to do that. It takes time. So, this is what we have to think about. So, in fact, David uh, Jeffrey went to Beijing and taught for several years a course on the Bible in English literature. Wonderful. He, there's lots of redemptive motifs and metaphors in English literature, so he had reason to describe what the cross was about, with Communist Party officials sitting there because they'd asked him to do it. And they made him an honorary professor. Amazing. Students, they, the Chinese brought students from all over China to Beijing to hear these courses. <laughs> we didn't even have to pay the travel bill. That's the way it works. So, this is what the secularists, the smart ones, are beginning to realize. That not all cultures support science, that there are underpinnings, that at the bottom level it is the non-quantitative things that make character that matter most. We have no idea how much of the current scientific literature is fabricated. We know it's a lot. And why wouldn't a Darwinian fabricate data if it advances their genes via their career? Absolutely no reason. The key question after the ones I've already given, in the beginning, what? The next one is altruism. Those are the issues about which you engage Darwinists. Don't bother with the rest. Leave it. It's screwing up uh, Western, particularly American evangelicalism, to get obsessed on seven-day creations and all the rest. It doesn't make a scrap of difference. I think Schaefer's wrong on that, and I'm sure that will upset a lot of you. Uh, but to anybody who's read a lot of texts, uh, the people I've talked to, would say, you've got to recognize the genre of the literature. If I read a story to you that began once upon a time in the land of Oz, what kind of story would it be? A fairy tale. It is also Tolkien's opening to the book of Job in his translation. Now, who knows more about ancient languages, you or Tolkien? Tolkien. 
And did Tolkien believe? Oh, yes. And you're a physician. You know that nobody would sit down on the ground and have long philosophical discussions about the nature of suffering and whether you can know God covered with boils. You know, I'm sure that there was a story that started that off. Uh, but the artistic structure of Job is brilliant. And that's what it's about. You've got to recognize the genre of the literature. Who knows where this comes from and the importance of this verse. The earth is fixed and it will not be moved forever. Where does it come from and why is it important historically? Psalms. It comes from the Psalms and why is it important? What? It came from either Luther or Calvin in, in objection to... Uh, no, before that. It is the verse that sank Galileo. Because the Catholic Church was committed to the literal veracity of scripture. And the Jesuit that Galileo had insulted earlier in his life kept a watch on him until he saw the way to activate the mechanisms to bring about the downfall of Galileo. And it was that verse. A literalistic reading that they learnt their lesson from. We have to learn better than that. And of course most prophecies in scripture have multiple fulfillments, not one. Any of you who are deeply interested in this, I have one copy with me of Jeremy Begbie's uh, wonderful three-hour DVD on music and post-modernity. If you are a musician and interested in Music Wars, the first one to get to me afterwards can have it. It's a fundraiser for the college. It's 25 bucks. If you're second, I'll take your name and address and you can have it by post. But these things matter. Now, so we have got to realize and catch up with these secularists uh, and talk about the things that matter, about meaning, about purpose, and about the virtues and their role in a society. Now, the interesting thing is how angry some of these really good uh, secularists are with people like Dawkins and Harris and Dennett. They are being trashed not by, they're being trashed by us as well, but we don't need to bother with us because that brings the anti-Christian thing in. Secularist, atheistic philosophers, Flew, Midgley, uh, Nagel, have all trashed da Dawkins, a sophomoric in his approach. And Harris uh, and Hitchens and Dennett. Uh, it's good to see them falling out with one another. Um, but it's sad that books like Dawkins' books should get to the top of the New York bestseller list. It just shows how badly our education system has failed. Uh, utterly indefensible books at any intellectual level. Um, the next area uh, in which we need to be more involved, and some secularists again are realizing, is that there is no explanation for death and suffering that can be derived from secularism. There are some secularist humanists who die bravely, but it will not meet the needs of the vast majority of people. And it does not, we have much better ways to do it as Christians. And as physicians, you have immense opportunities to infect the, the culture with that reality by collecting what I call happiness for stories. The descriptions of people passing from this life to the next where God shows up, especially in the death of children. Uh, when I tell Diane Comte's story of her first, the child that brought her back to faith, or started the journey back to faith, to uh, st medical student audiences, they're going to cry. And it doesn't matter what they believe, she's got to them. You know the story, I, I imagine most of you, but for those who don't, she, like me, grew up in a Christian home, went to university, put her faith on the shelf. In a very serious way, in her case, she became an existentialist. But she had the virtues of a good Christian upbringing, so she's honest, hardworking, and reliable. Ends up professor of oncology, pediatric oncology at Yale, and did everything for the kids. But because she was an existentialist, she had nothing to say to a dying child. The only logical thing she could say is, this is absurd, I'm glad that it's you and not me. That would be true, but neither kind nor helpful. And being a kind, helpful lady, she didn't say it. She simply avoided the problem by not being there. But her mother kept appearing at the back of her head and saying, you ought to be there. 
And then she describes how eventually she gave in and she sat with a little girl, about eight, dying of leukemia. The first one she sat with. And just before she died, she sat up in bed and said, Mummy, can you see the angels? Can you hear their singing? It's beautiful. And she fell back dead. What are you going to do with that experience? Dismiss it? Or many of your colleagues know that this sort of thing happens. We tend to keep it secretly. In fact, we should say, do you know what happened today? We, this, this is where we get at the culture. Where, with the reality that, that all our colleagues know that not everybody dies in the same way. Some people die well. We need to learn to tell those stories well. Students are very willing, this is down to number eight by the stage, to give a serious hearing to Christianity because they're struggling with soft nihilism. If you need to go a bit further than this, the paper to read is David Hart's paper, Christ and Nothing, published in 2005 in First Things. Not an easy paper to read. It will take you, this is one to write a precy on. Paragraph by paragraph, distill his essential ideas and write it out. But it's brilliantly written. He's a young man, an American. I was amazed how young he is. Uh, unfortunately, he writes so well, uh, as I predicted when I found out, he doesn't speak so well. Because if you ask him a question, he'll think everything you've thought and begin from there. <laughs> uh, sort of leave everybody standing. But Christ and Nothing is a superb paper about what we're dealing with. He convinced me that the problem is not soft paganism, but soft nihilism. Seinfeldism, the belief that there is really nothing out there, that we are all there is. And that, of course, leads to a power struggle. It leads to alienation. It leads to what we are seeing, where people will kill for a leather, leather jacket or a pair of shoes in a high school. And that's the legacy of Nietzsche. That's where it comes from. David Hart does a brilliant discussion of this, and he points out as McIntyre had before him, only when the Christian church gets back to the point where it can produce saints equivalent to the martyrs of the early church and the modern church, is that going to change. We are not convincing because we are too comfortable. Probably the only book that's really appropriate to us at the moment is Amos. Uh, we are in the state of Israel at the time of Amos in many ways. So... Christians will take, uh, students will take a real interest in a serious discussion of these things. Uh, and that's the good news. Christian students in particular, I mean, the, it was delightful for us this year because of Scott Boyle's uh, work last year, the year before, setting up a, a Northeast Conference for medical students and doing a lot of work to get people to come. So they had several hundred students turn up from 14 medical schools. Uh, and for me, it was a wonderful conference, and one of the best things out of that conference, we get a student coming to Augustine last year, being abused by the University of Virginia, as many Christian students are. Uh, when she finished her year with us, she said to her mother, that was a wonderful year, but you know, I could be doing medicine now. And her mother said, you wouldn't be doing medicine, you'd be in a psychiatric hospital. <laughs> That's what they're doing. Students are burning out. I had a student I was sp speaking to this morning who said he'd converted to Catholicism and taken a year off to study it. A wonderful year, he said. Now I'm back in medical school and they're burning me already. And he's lonely. Uh, hospitality is what is needed. Uh, the gift of hospitality, I don't think it will be possible to underestimate it in the near future. Not to get on their case, but just to be there and love them. No student should go to, to medical school or indeed university without having families that will love them locally. There's a mission that every church can fulfill in a university town. So that, that brings us to the key question. How do we argue our case? And I think we argue the case on justice and democracy. We, Quebec has just had a huge uh, uh, public forum that's gone all around the province discussing the question of accommodation to Islam in Quebec. And I haven't read it yet, but it's just been, the report has just been published. I suspect the conclusions are politically correct, but it's the content you're going to need to read. Uh, it, it's, it's a real problem. 
that we have got to start thinking about. And Habermas said, look, it's not just accommodating uh, the Muslims. They're only a minority in, in North America. But the real question is, is the liberal elite going to accommodate the Christian majority? I've said already in this conference, and I'll say it again because it still hasn't penetrated as far as I think it needs to go, we practice a profession that is a moral profession, not a technical one. Because what you do when you see a patient is you help them to decide what they ought to do. And in our world, and unlike ancient Christendom, you cannot get from an is statement to an ought statement. It's not possible. So unless there is a moral basis to the practice of medicine, we are bound to be at loggerheads. Since we no longer have a moral consensus, the Catholics have thought about it. It's called the doctrine of subsidiarity. It is the duty of the state in our case and of the insurance companies and the state in your case to deliver the money at the level where there is a moral consensus and then to allow the decisions of how it will be used. So their job is not to be on a case-by-case -case basis because they can't do that. You will have an entirely view of your, different view of your duty to a dying person if you're a Christian or an atheist, logically. And so there will be different protocols. They ca you cannot write one for both groups. But we have at this stage to come to some means of accommodating one another. That's why I think we should be planning now what we are going to do when we decide the time has come that we have a secular hospital system, a university system, and a Christian one. Not on grounds of religion, but on grounds of justice and democracy. No liberal can argue against that, except that they're going to lose the, the power that they've had, and they're not going to give up easily. But how can they make the argument against it? I don't believe they can. We need to do that. Uh, when they try and, and hold on to power, all sorts of amusing things happen. We're going through the process in Canada at the moment. If you want to follow it, you, you can follow it on the news. But we have some terrible kangaroo courts called human rights tribunals uh, that are dominated by the homosexual lobby and by ardent liberals and feminists who would like to send people like me to prison. Um, and they're going too far. And humour is getting to them. Uh, one of them was interviewing somebody who was charged with hate speech and didn't know. He said, may I record you? And they couldn't say no. They didn't tell them that he was also videoing it and it went on YouTube. The woman who was interviewing him ran away and resigned the day after it came out on YouTube because he made mincemeat of her. And Mark Stein, whom some of you have read uh, America Alone, He's being tried at the moment, and you can imagine what fun that is going to turn out to be. Uh, they're trying to avoid him as far as possible. I hope they don't. I, I hope that that will appear not only on YouTube, but as a permanent video for feminists to watch in purgatory. Uh, so the bottom line is that we have a lot to contribute to this world that... Novak is right that secularism is coming to an end, but that means that we have some duties. We will have things to do. This is for your benefit back there. We can't be pietistic and escape. The world has still to be governed, and we will have to do our duty. Uh, obviously, that's work that I hope I don't have to do, uh, but I do want to see us seriously thinking about training our brightest and best to be able to do the jobs that need to be done. Clearly, the American system is not sending your brightest and best to the White House, is it? Uh, the system is failing. And so we need some renewal in the sense of education for leadership. Thank you.